Is there something that is taken for granted or presupposed in debates concerning illegal immigration? In this lecture video, I'm going to be looking at the article by Luis Placencia titled The Undocumented Mexican Migrant Question, Re-examining the Framing of Law and Illegalization in the United States. So, the terms illegal immigrant and undocumented immigrant incorporate a taken-for-granted sense about the meaning of the terms. That when we say illegal immigrant, uh, we might be referring to the fact that there's a, a crime committed. When we say undocumented immigrant, which is typically um, advocates or, or those who uh, are more pro-immigration you know, immigration or, or don't want to be punitive, prefer the term undocumented immigrant because it's meant to say, well, it's not that they committed a crime, they're just not formally documented by uh, the United States government, so all you have to do is just document them. But in these debates with these two terms that are used, what is actually presupposed? Placentia says, well, an alien is defined as any person not a citizen or national of the United States. So, legally, Immigrants are persons formally admitted for permanent residency. Likewise, then, on the other hand, legally, non-immigrants are persons allowed temporary entry visa, uh, uh, sorry, allowed temporary entry via visa or other process. So it actually turns out that when we talk about illegal immigrant or undocumented immigrant, that the legal term of an immigrant already designates an allowance of entry. So the terms, then, illegal immigrant and undocumented immigrant are oxymorons that more accurately reflect popular political notions rather than formal juridical constructs. Now you might say, okay, you know, this is uh, uh, just uh, a, a popular use in, in terms. It doesn't really reflect anything meaningful or material. We can just have uh, another term that we can use instead to talk about this issue. And Placencia says, okay, well, you know, maybe you can use the term illegal alien because that's closer to the formal categories uh, regarding uh, presence and, and entrance uh, across the border into the country. But Placencia, though, is interested in, in what is actually the, the history, what's the genealogy of these terms when we refer to um, illegal immigrants and undocumented immigrants, and what can that tell us about our moral practices towards uh, uh, these individuals and in this uh, debate. So most migrants become subject to removal for three general reasons. The first, violating the terms of the visa. The second, convicted of specific, uh, specified crimes. And the third, entering the territory without formal authorization. So Placentia is interested in that third reason why migrants are subject for removal. So who are the illegal or undocumented migrants that are subject to this removal? So looking at the history, we find that since the late 1920s, a southward political gaze has dominated much of the national political discussion regarding what's known as unlawful presence. So Placenti notes that first, we find that the Mexico-US boundary area has been coded as the border, that we don't typically think of ports of entry, literally seaports. We typically don't think of airports as the border, even though technically it is. This is where people come into and leave the country. And it's not just the case that this is in popular uh, imagination, but as well, this is how it's referred to in members of Congress and the media and so on. Second, Placentia notes that the labels illegal or undocumented migrants have come to be largely associated with Mexican origin persons and their possible unlawful entry that creates a near synonym between the concept of illegal undocumented immigrant or alien and a Mexican migrant. So there's this kind of uh, ethnic or, or racial or national um, assumption regarded in the terms illegal immigrant or undocumented immigrant. Additionally, what we find in looking at the data is that more than half of those who are subject to removal have overstayed their visas compared to those who cross the border. 
So it's very interesting when we think about actually how this issue is discussed. Usually it's referred to uh, Latinos or uh, Mexicans, uh, Guatemalans, you know, those coming from the southern border. We think of when we're thinking about illegal immigration, undocumented immigration, it's having to do with the southern border. And yet statistically, more than half of those who were subject to removal were granted visas that didn't just necessarily cross the border illegally in this way. What might that tell us about the kind of moral assumptions that are going on when we use these terms illegal immigration and undocumented immigration? So Placentia says that it's historically been the case that what has determined alien status is not actually migration. It's instead the movement of borders and political authority. That this issue is actually a construct. Now, this does not mean to say it's a construct. It does not mean to say there aren't real consequences um, that have to be uh, dealt with politically. But it's to say when we talk about uh, a migration and an undocumented or illegal immigrant, we're not just talking about actually the actions of, of an individual where the sole uh, responsibility for their status is on the individual, but we're talking about political power. So I want to look at two passages uh, um, where Placentia gives this kind of uh, history here. So I want to look first uh, pages 122 to 123. So what Placentia says is that the end of the U.S.-Mexican War and its aftermath contributed to the positioning of Mexicans in the acquired territory as racialized social political other. While the 1848 treaty, treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo granted collective U.S. citizenship to the approximately 100,000 Mexican descent individuals who remained in the acquired territory, this did not guarantee that they or their descendants would be granted full membership rights or be perceived as belonging in the nation. Even individuals who trace their descent to Mexican or Spanish families settled in the territory prior to 1848 are at times thought of as possible immigrants to the United States. And we can think about perhaps cases of racial profiling um, by police officers when certain individuals are pulled over, asked for their papers. Uh, continuing, Placencia says, the terms illegal immigrant or alien and the noun form illegals, as noted above, have come to be commonly associated with Mexican origin migrants, yet their origins are not with that community. The entry prohibitions enacted by Congress under the 1875 Page Law and 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act were aimed at restricting primarily Chinese migration, and so in the late 19th century, public and governmental concern was with the illegal entry of alien Chinese. With the emergence of anti-Japanese sentiments on the West Coast in the early 1900s, concern shifted to the illegal entry of alien Japanese. Uh, so concern shifted then to Europeans from Canada and Mexico, who also emerged in the early 1900s. So between 1900 and 1930, as noted by the historian George Sanchez, the term alien began to be applied to Mexicans in the Southwest. Within news media, the first appearance of the label illegal alien appears to be a New York Times article in the 1926 that describes the energetic Andrew Donaldson from Ireland who entered the United States from Canada on a bicycle after riding 300 miles. Although the term illegal immigrant had wide circulation in the 1930s, in the context of mass deportation drives of Mexicans, the noun form, for example, illegal, now commonly invoked to label Mexican migrants, was not initially applied to Mexicans. It was applied to European Jewish migrants in the 1930s who sought to enter British-controlled Palestine. We find then that academic uses of illegals in reference to Mexican migrants doesn't actually appear until the 1970s. According to the detailed account by Leo Chavez regarding the anti-Mexican migrant discourse in popular magazines and the work of Fernandez and Pedroza in newspapers, the early 1970s was key in the association 
of Mexican migration and illegality. In the early 1970s, the label illegal alien and illegals became common references in the discussions of the migration crisis on the Mexico-U.S. boundary area. The 1970s, however, were not only important to the circulation of the term illegal migrant, the period was also important to the emergence of opposition to that term. So what we can find here is this kind of uh, genealogy of the term and the kind of uh, uh, um, implications that are associated with when we talk about the term, whether an illegal alien is um, a European and Irish, is whether an illegal alien is a Chinese, and now whether it is a Mexican or a Latino. So I want to continue reading here on page um, 124. So what Placencia writes is that the inaction of federal prosecutors and migration officials regarding the 1885 contract labor law in the Southwest and the World War I migrant contract labor under the Ninth Proviso of the uh, 1917 Immigration Act are two of many examples of this process. The open border incidents in 1948 and 1954, wherein U.S. migration officials chose to disregard entry inspection procedures, and applicable federal restrictions on the Mexico-U.S. border and allowed several thousands of individuals to enter U.S. territory are noteworthy because of the blurring of whether those persons allowed entry are thought of as having been formally authorized entry or not, right? The United States kind of obscures uh, what kind of inspection procedures are allowed and when we allow some people in where we don't necessarily have to formally investigate them or check them or whatever, and we say, well, okay, uh, I guess those are not illegal immigrants, but then we change what is required to be entered into the country. And well, would that mean those who weren't inspected beforehand now are illegal or they're legal and then those who aren't inspected now are illegal? So continuing Placency writes, the migrants were not issued any documents. And so they can be thought of as undocumented immigrants but their entry was authorized by federal officials, so they were legally admitted under the discretion assumed by the officials and directives from higher authorities at INS. I think we can also then, similarly, think about the rise and fall of the Patrones businesses from 1885 to 1925, where uh, it was often the case that when one wanted to migrate to the United States, you didn't have a lot of income, you didn't know how you were going to survive. So a lot of times these businesses, known as padrones, were set up where uh, you, let's say you're coming from Europe or somewhere else, uh, you contact the business, they are going to set you up with a job somewhere in the United States so you know when you get there, um, you, you have work. And of course you pay the business beforehand um, uh, when you get there or you pay them some of the money that you make uh, when you're working in, in the United States. Now, the problem with the Padrones was that if you were from the Mexico region, why would you need a Padrones business to get work? It was often the case that, you know, uh, people from the, you know, of, of me uh, Mexican descent uh, are from the general region of the Southwest United States. They didn't need a business to set up for them some work in the, in the United States. Oftentimes, they would do just seasonal labor, come in the United States, work for a while, go back to Mexico. Um, and so we saw then that the patrones were actually losing potential business. Why? Well, because the border wasn't uh, really formally enforced. Yes, it was recognized that there's a border, but there wasn't this sense of, well, we need to police who comes in and out of uh, into the country from the southern border and who doesn't until the Padrones realized they're losing profit. And so they actually attempted to lobby the United States government to regulate border crossings so Mexicans would need to actually um, pay the Padrones in order to work in the United States. So we can also see the influence of corporations then on U.S. law and on enforcing immigration policy. So the anti-migrant and pro-migrant perspectives then at times share the premise that the individual is the principal determining actor, which means they both, whether you're anti-migrant or pro-migrant, obfuscate or erase then the role of the state. As Placencia says, the former, the anti-migrant position, situates the illegal migrant as someone who consciously chose to break the law 
particularly at entry restrictions. The latter, the pro-migrant perspective, labels a migrant who did not obtain, for unexamined reasons, the necessary documents to enter the United States as an undocumented immigrant. In both cases, the state, both Mexican and United States, recedes in the political horizon. In the first case, uh, from uh, uh, the case of the anti-migrant perspective, the law is neutral and fixed, where someone who enters U.S. territory without authorization is a lawbreaker, and such persons have no legal right to remain and must be expelled according to the rule of law. In the second perspective, the pro-migrant perspective, the role of the state in setting admission quotas, criteria for adjustment status, or decisions on who gets and does not get papers, the encouragement then of the growth of a remittance sending population, and so on, are generally skewed. So the, 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 the premise and both arguments from the anti-migrant and pro-migrant perspectives are that there is a clear and mutually exclusive categorization in the Constitution of Migrant Status, which, according to Placencia, contains intrinsic errors by both obfuscating or erasing the role of the state. So their both views, actually, both pro- and anti-migrant, end up laying unnecessary uh, moral blame on the individual who is determined to be an illegal or undocumented migrant. Now, what Placencia does is offer some kind of an alternative nomenclature, and his, pl uh, his proposal is that we use the alternative labels of informally authorized and formally authorized migrants. By using these terms, instead of undocumented uh, immigrant or illegal immigrant, he says what we do is first acknowledge that the presence of such migrants is tacitly recognized and allowed through the discretion of federal authorities. In this case, then, there's already a kind of uh, admittance that, well, through some uh, tacit or implicit uh, uh, um, consent, these individuals are here in the United States. Secondly, what this does is it does not deter employers from employing such persons, that then they can uh, 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 work and receive subsistence for their labor while they live in the United States. And third, he says, in effect, by using these labels, it authorizes their physical presence and their participation in the economy. So it doesn't uh, dehumanize or delegitimize their labor um, and their presence in society as a member of society, even though they might not be formally authorized. But I do wonder, what negatives uh, might there be if we um, start using these kinds of labels that are proposed by Placentia? And... Do these labels fully address the issue that's at the heart of the debate in, um, uh, let's say, uh, formally authorized uh, immigration and uh, informally authorized immigration? Does it really address uh, the material concerns? Uh, 